to the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. Powered by the Precision Metal Forming Association. I, of course, I am your host, Dean Phillips, and I'm proud to be here. Uh, from Right Hand Technology Group, I have with me today, of course, I have with me Jason Vanzen. Jason, welcome, sir. He is, of course, the CEO. Welcome, Jason. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dean. I look forward to uh, the conversation. It is phenomenal to have an expert like yourself on here on the show. So right off the bat, we usually like to ask, what is your big takeaway for the next five years? What do you see coming down the road? Well, I mean, I think it's already coming, but uh, cybersecurity uh, threats evolving, obviously with AI, um, making it even more uh, complicated. And, uh, and the compliance that's going to come with that to kind of force manufacturers to address it because it's, you know, it's getting worse and, you know, manufacturers are trying to make things right. They're not trying, they're not in the business of cybersecurity, but unfortunately they're going to have to be. Right. I think that's a great point. What, what are some of the biggest challenges you see coming right now? What, what are some of the biggest problems? Uh, well, AI, as you can imagine, is changing cybersecurity. You used to be able to read an email and be like, ah, oh, this, I could tell this isn't a, you know, a native speaker. This is, you could tell it's a scam. But now with AI, obviously those scams get better and better and better. Automation makes it much more uh, quicker to get these things out and get them changed. And uh, obviously, if you can harvest social media data, you can customize them and make them seem more uh, realistic. Um, so I would say that's going to be a huge, huge shift. Um, so the targeting is going to get better. The audio, I mean, I'm sure you've seen some of the AI audio stuff that's going to get a lot better. I'm sure, I don't know if you've seen in South Korea, there was a, a company that got fooled by a, a deep fake of the CEO and had like $25 million stolen. So it's, it's rapidly changing and it's going to require a lot of um, shifts in policies and procedures because ultimately that, you know, policies and procedures are how you're going to protect yourself. Um, you know, like for example, if somebody calls up and says they're from the bank, you shouldn't just take the word for it. You should have a policy and procedure how you, you know, maybe hang up the phone. You have identified uh, numbers that you're going to you use to call back. You call back that number to verify that they really are who they say they are. So things like that seem kind of old manual processes that can that can help you. Right, and I think that's a very good point because I I know you know we look at some of like the banking and other organizations, certainly even the I know when you contact any of the phone company systems uh, on your on your cell phones, you get a confirming text message to say, yeah, it's okay. This is who I want to talk to. And uh, it, it kind of closes that loop on security. And uh, I, I think for me, it adds a peace of mind to know that when I'm calling them, that they're checking that and confirming that element of it. Of course, it's yeah. not you checking it; it's them checking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, if they if they have your cell phone number, for example, and they call you, well, they can send you a text message. So you 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 have to somewhat almost verify both directions, not just count on one sided verification. Yeah, I I often look at it as when I go into the doctor's office and they put on the gloves. If you think about it, it's not for your protection; it's for their protection. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's that's the main point of it is that they it may have the illusion and it may have an, a compound effect of also providing security to you, but it's it's there for them because that's inevitably what they're trying to protect is if they protect their company by extension they're protecting people that they're working with. Definitely. Um, so tell me tell me a little bit about your background. How did you get involved in this? Uh, well, I guess I started off, um, more on the kind of it infrastructure side. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I've been in, I've been in this for 26 years now. Um, so I started off on that side, started working with manufacturers, just building their infrastructure as they grew and supporting them. And, and then you typically end up having to put cybersecurity controls in. Um, but then about a decade ago, I kind of got more into the cybersecurity side from the what we call the governance side of things kind of the higher level management 
um, because there's just like in a manufacturing plant, you got ISO and things you, you follow to ensure quality and everything. It's the same thing in cybersecurity. So you have, which ISO actually has a, a framework of their own. Um, but most IT technical people aren't good at that piece. They're not good at the, the, the governance side. And I kind of got more into that and just, you know, kind of really just simplify it down so people can actually, you know, absorb it and, and, and acknowledge it. So that's where we, as a right-hand technology group, we work with manufacturers, a lot of them in the DOD supply chain. So CMMC is a big, a big thing mm -hmm. for us right now. Um, just helping them run cybersecurity programs. They might have IT people in, in house, um, but they don't have the cybersecurity uh, skills in house. And it's obviously expensive skill set. And there's, I think there's like supposedly going to be 3 million jobs unfilled in cybersecurity because there's just not enough cybersecurity people. Um, but you know, I kind of just progressed through IT and then supporting manufacturing and running the IT department and and just having to address those things to doing it for multiple companies as a consultant. And then obviously as cybersecurity evolves and gets worse and worse, just kind of moved more into that side. Well, I mean, we still manage the IT and stuff because they go kind of hand in hand, but um, our specialty is kind of the cybersecurity piece of that. What, if you were to point at a couple of things that, that are really critical today. What are a couple of the key pieces that companies need to start looking for today? I, I mean, obviously, the longer you put it off, the worse it gets. Uh, and the higher your risk is of just, just like anything when it comes to safety or security, the longer you put it off, the, the greater chance you have of being exposed to a, to a hazard or a risk. So, what what are some of the things that people can need to do and need to be looking at today? Yeah, I would say it's uh, number one. I think kind of the governance side of things, right? Because it's so like a lot of companies they let their IT guy handle it or IT department handle it, and they they put in some you know they put in some good stuff. They put antivirus and firewalls, um, but really like you don't know what you don't know unless you're approaching it systematically. So, IT governance and having a cybersecurity program that management understands their risk and they they make decisions about what risk they're going to accept or not versus just abdicating it to the IT department and you know and expect and going to hold them accountable for things they don't really have control over um I was, I'd say that's a big one uh obviously user training I'm, I mean everybody's kind of been hearing about security awareness training but uh, we still get a lot of pushback when we try to like to more frequent training it's like oh people are already busy but it's just like unless you keep at top of mind that security awareness it's it's uh, it's gonna fail and you got to test them too so you got to try to like you know you want you want the good guy to act like the bad guy to see if people fall for it and you got to do that as well um and then train the people who are falling for it and then the last thing i would say i mean there's obviously a lot more but the last thing i would say is uh vulnerability management so i'm sure you've you know, you hear about patches, you got Windows patches, you got zero day patches, but also in manufacturing, you got IoT devices, you got uh, operational technology, all those things, you got machines that are connected in network. Um, those things they maintained as well. You know, they have firmware updates that come out. I know like Rockwell's just had, I think a couple of different big vulnerabilities recently. Um, those things need to be maintained as well, where most, most people I see that, you know, they'll handle the Windows patches, but they don't think about the the bigger, um, you know, the bigger picture of everything has to be patched and maintained and secured. And I think that's like a, I don't know, it's like a third or 40% of the breaches are because of unpatched vulnerabilities. It's interesting that you mentioned that because I think that's one of the things that uh, people look at it. Well, we haven't had an attack, so we must be good. You know, it's yeah. kind of like safety. Well, we haven't had an accident, so therefore everything must be okay. That yeah. that does not one does not mean the other, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And I and unfortunately, a lot of times, even when something does happen, I just posted replied to somebody's LinkedIn post about CMMC and how, you know, it's it seems to be taken like Georgia Tech has a false claims act against them right now because they, you know, were saying they were doing one thing and they weren't doing it cyber, you know, for cybersecurity and they do government work. Um, and I'm sure they're probably taking a lot of action right now but unfortunately people go back to the way they were just like if you have a health scare all of a sudden you start eating a little better you start exercising but unless you really change your habits and you really have discipline you're going to go back to the way you were until the next health scare so the same thing with cybersecurity. things happen sure. people get all 
you know, management gets, you know, upset about it rightfully and they they yeah. want things to be done, but then they go back to their normal, like, you know, I want to <laughs> kind of head ostrich, you know, go back with the ostrich tactic and yeah. stick your head in the ground and hope it, hope it goes away. So um, that's why I think compliance is going to be more and more a driving force to get this stuff done because um, it's, Unfortunately, you know, you kind of need to be forced into it, just like HIPAA with healthcare. Um, yeah. And then the other big thing is supply chain. So a lot of these attacks are coming through your supply chain, which is why CMMC is so big in the DOD space is, you know, the, the military is having data stolen through their supply chain. So by forcing CMMC through the supply chain, they at least know that uh, there's a base level of cybersecurity in place. And I think you'll see that get adopted over the next five years more and more across the industry um which again why why i think compliance is going to be so big right right and i i, I think you you kind of hit it on the head there uh you know everybody has something and then they react you know so that it's it's not that you were being proactive on your cybersecurity and your uh, your your entire system awareness and and system health as mm -hmm. you know if you think about it, whether your body or you think about it from the standpoint of your uh, your entire system, and it's funny, you know, you look back on the back to the '80s when when computers were first starting to get going. Well, before the internet, <laughs> you you didn't the the only way you were going to get a, something bad happening to you was if somebody came in and got it into your computer. Now. Nobody has to be anywhere near your computer. You know, they can yeah. be hundreds, if not thousands of miles away from you uh, and access your your system. And I think that firewall protection also, how you're how you're protecting yourself from that standpoint, what are you allowing in? You know, narrowing that area that you're you're allowing into your system. The smaller the exposure, the the lower the chance of the risk is yeah is that something you guys look at yeah yeah i'm sure you hear you well if, i mean if you have and you're going to hear about it more and more is zero trust so mm -hmm. zero trust is basically you don't you only trust what you've um you know identified like this is what i you know this is what i trust so you know manufacturing if you have um machines on a network they should be segmented there should be no, they shouldn't you shouldn't allow or trust anything to come in and out of there except for mm -hmm. you specifically allow so maybe allow a machine to talk to um you know seeing c machine that sends its instructions but that's it right and and then maybe those are only allowed to talk over specific ports because those are the only ports they need to talk over so that's it nothing else right and right that's kind of the big thing is like you're saying lowering your exposure uh kind of exposure management of just minimizing the attack surface which is what going back to vulnerability management you're trying to find those vulnerabilities before you know the bad guys do and and mitigate them and patch them and get rid of them so you're constantly um makes that being proactive versus reactive right yeah that's right. that's something you you should always do but a lot of people need to also look at their outbound so people just always block the inbound but the outbound you get somebody click on an email and it launches something on their computer if it's a lot outbound um mm -hmm. You know, it's going to talk talk back to the to the bad guys. Send them the data they're looking for. But if you're blocking outbound, except for things that you want to allow, you know, that would that would be blocked, right? Right, right. Let me ask you this: uh, when we when we look at networking from the standpoint of wide area networks versus uh, local area network, uh, what's if you're trying to network your entire infrastructure and you're you've got machines on the floor that really don't need to have an external uh, monitoring system, is there a way to to do that safely, or is it leaning towards as safe as possible? Um, so let me just make sure I understand. So there's a machine on the floor, and you want to make sure it's not talking external. Right. So if if you have if I load on software for monitoring those those pieces of equipment and mm -hmm. they're on my server inside of my company, so it has yeah. no need to go external, but you're yeah. still going to need to network it through, you know, through whatever 
system, whether you're actually doing a, a, a communication system over yeah. a wireless or a wired system. Is, is there, are there better provisions to limit your exposure that way? Yeah, so that's where segment your network would come in. So, you know, again, kind of like a minimizing attack surface. So if that, that server got compromised, how do you limit like their ability to move around and, hit, and get to other things? So if you segment those, machi those machines onto their own network and then you only allow that server to talk to those machines through this port, you know, you, you drastically reduce their ability to move laterally within the network. Um, and then you could put that server on its own segment and then users on their own segment. So if a user clicks on something, you know, okay, they're in this user network, but they can't get to the other network, right? So maybe users don't need to talk to that server. So you block the ability for users to talk to that server and only the machines talk to that server. It's really just kind of mapping it all out. You know, we talk mm -hmm. about data flow diagrams, like how the data flows and what really needs to communicate with what. Um, unfortunately, it requires you know, work that's not super exciting for, for IT people. They're used to just, you know, um, you know, the technology piece of it, but you got to kind of step back and say, okay, how does data flow? How does it come in? How does it go out? Who needs to touch it? And then you kind of, that's, that's getting into the zero trust, right? Like making sure that only the people that need to talk to that system or access that data can and nobody else um, requires extra administrative effort, mm -hmm. but Unfortunately, that's that's what it's going to take to avoid the, you know, the extra effort it's going to take to respond to an incident. Right, right, yeah, it, and it's it is becoming more of a challenge. I mean, I think every one of us reads the a news story or something on the internet about you know this company got hacked, this company got hacked, and if you're even if you're getting reports from third party services that monitor your credit and things like that. Mm -hmm. There's always another report of something happening, you know, where your yeah. your information has been compromised, and even the the best companies, you know, again going through third party because most of these attacks that happen to you aren't happening to you because somebody got a hold of your your social security or credit card or something like that. Most of them are happening through a third party system that that you get these notifications when you're. Uh, your information has been exposed. <clears throat> I know you talked about governance and one of the things that uh, I, I have questions on is how do we, how do we work towards a, a solution that works for everybody, especially when you have companies that are worldwide, uh, how do you work towards that from a governance standpoint? Well, I mean, there are frameworks. So, um, you know, I'm not smart enough to just come up with my own framework. There's, there's much smarter people that put those together. You got the <laughs> National Institute of Standards and Technology to put put out the cybersecurity framework. Uh, you know, they're also yes. in developing this, the CMMC framework. Um, the ISO 27001, they've developed a framework. It's just really taking those frameworks. I think the challenge is, is people don't know how to utilize them. Um, you know, it's just kind of like an assessment, just going through each, each uh, practice or control that they tell you you should have in place figuring out how does this apply to our organization and then, you know, determining, do we have this gap? So, you know, identifying the gaps in your current stamp posture, um, building out a roadmap to close those as best you can, making sure management understands the gaps and that they, they need, if, if they want to accept it, they, at least they know that what they're accepting. Um, and then just constantly driving around, you know, being proactive, constantly closing those gaps, reassessing, you know, annually. Um, again, I think people that, you know, have ISO um, certifications for the plant, kind of get it, right? Like you got to constantly stay on top of that stuff, audit it, assess it, make sure that you're, you're following what you're supposed to be following. Um, and same thing with cybersecurity. So there are frameworks. It's just find the people that know how to use them and just follow them. Yeah. And they adapt, it right? Over time, as technology adapts, the, those organizations adapt them. You don't have to worry about, you know, does my IT company have their own way of doing it? Doing it, You know, again, I think manufacturers understand that with, you know, ISO standards and things like that, um, which is why, you know, why they exist. So, you know, like, okay, I know this company has policies and procedures. I know their product's going to be consistent across the board because they have this ISO certification. Right, right. At least you would hope that's the case. 
Yeah. <laughs> what what you mentioned about you know the leadership within a within a company. How hard is that to get them? I guess active in the process of understanding what needs to be done and understand the risks. Is that a very complicated thing usually? Uh, I wish it wasn't, but but yeah. It is complicated. Again, these, I mean, obviously I understand I, I run a business. I know there's a million other things to worry about, but um, what we do when we work with the company is we, re, we, we set up a steering committee. Mm -hmm. So, so, and we were, you know, we ask the executives to be on it. Uh, ultimately, again, ultimately they're going to be accountable, which is going to get more and more prevalent as compliance comes uh, like CMMC, for example, is requires a senior official to sign off every year. And if, if they're signing off, they could be personally liable if, you know, if they're not, if they don't really know what's going on. Um, sure. So we create a cybersecurity steering committee. So when we do say an assessment versus CMMC or ISO, we present to the steering committee, here's the gaps, here's our game plan, you know, get their buy-in, get their um, approval. Maybe they have some input themselves um, and then constantly keep them up to date. So, you know, that might be a monthly meeting, a quarterly meeting and make sure that they're, they're in the loop on what the risks are how we think they should address it, get their input, also get their input on what changes are coming from them because that might affect risk as well. And then right. make sure they understand what risk they really have. And then they got to make decisions. They got to be accountable for those decisions because they're going to be accountable right. one way one way or another. It's better yep. to know what you're being accountable for than not, <laughs> than not know. So that's how Absolutely. we do it. I wouldn't say it's foolproof. You still, you know, you still got, uh, Especially, you know, when you're an outside consultant, you know, there's sometimes that like sometimes people want yes men and you know, so it's like it's you don't want to be a yes man, but you also don't want the client to just get mad and fire you because you're you're not a you know, you're not a yes man. Right. So it's constant, constant struggle. Yeah. Well, I, and I think people need to understand it's a partnership. I think that's yeah. one of the most critical aspects. You know. Yeah. And you gotta be able to talk in business terms, which is, you know, again for IT people is not always easy you got to be able to you got to be able to explain what this risk means in a business terms right, right? not just well you got to take this technology because it's cool mm -hmm. yeah so. i agree and so jason how can people reach you uh easiest thing's probably our website righthandtechnologygroup.com uh obviously we're i'm on linkedin uh i think just slash jason vanzen on linkedin uh i don't have any big youtube or twitter or any of that so those would be the two main places that's okay well that that's that's good enough if that's how people could reach you well we really appreciate it thank you for for being on the show today uh it's it's great to have you here yep. if there's, I appreciate it. oh absolutely it's been my pleasure and if there's anything that uh, any of you have questions on please reach out to jason we appreciate it thank you